Welcome to the Expositors of Second Baptist Church of Houston North Campus. The class hosts the teaching ministry of James Brooks. Our mission is to grow in the knowledge of Christ through the expositional teaching of God's Word. We do this by studying the Bible line upon line and verse by verse. We teach sound doctrine as we look at and live out God's unfolding plan of redemption for His Church. Now let's join James in this week's study of God's Holy Word. Okay, <laughs> well then let's jump right into our study over heaven. What we're going to be doing over the next few weeks is that we are going to be looking at answering questions because this work deals more with theology, dealing specifically with that section of theology known as eschatology, or the study of the last things, the doctrine of the last things, and specifically as it relates to this place called heaven. And so over the next few weeks, then, we're going to be looking at answering these questions. Number one, what we'll look at today, who goes to heaven? If heaven is a very real place, what does it take for one to get there? Because most Americans think they're going to heaven. Most Americans look at heaven like they do at Florida. They want to go because the weather is nice and they think most of their relatives are there. And that's why people you know, think, well, that's why I'm going to heaven. Because I can be a good person. That's one of the things that uh, if you've ever taken a course on evangelism, they'll ask the question, you know, when you talk to people, you say, uh, do you believe that you'll go to heaven? Well, certainly. What makes you think that you'll go to heaven when you die? If the answer is, because I was a good person, immediately, if you've had any evangelistic training whatsoever, you're knowing in your mind that, number one, they're not trusting in Christ for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. In fact, they are not on their way to heaven. They are on the broad path that leads to hell. So who goes to heaven? When we walk out of the gym today, we will hopefully know the answer to that question. Secondly, what and where is heaven? What and where is heaven? We'll look at that when I uh, come back. This week I'll be leaving to go to uh, the Master's Seminary, so I'll be out there. I'll be out for a couple of weeks, but then when I come back, that way you guys should have plenty of time to be able to review and read uh, the books. And that's what we'll look at next time when I'm with you, which is what and where is heaven? And then what will heaven be like? What will it be like when, once we're finally there? Are we going to be like what we see in those Bugs Bunny cartoons? Like little angels sitting on the side of a cloud with wings? And a halo playing a harp. Is that what we do in heaven? What will it be like in heaven? Will I be able to move at the speed of thought? Will I be, will I be able to, you know, able to leap tall single, uh, buildings at a single bound? What will I be like? Or what will it be like in heaven? And then finally, what will we do in heaven? And I've saved that one for last because it deals specifically with the principal reason why God created us. And that was for man to worship him. Our principal function in heaven is worship. Is worship. And so that's what we're going to be doing for the next, say, five to eight weeks. Uh, and then I want to leave plenty of time at the end to allow you to ask any questions as we go through that. And so that's the plot, uh, the course that's been plotted for us, and that's where we'll be uh, headed over the next few weeks. So let's uh, go back and then look at our study for this morning. Who goes to heaven? Who goes to heaven? To find that answer out, we need to look no place further than a story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you'll turn with me over to Ch uh, Luke chapter 16, we're going to look at verses 16 through 31. I know it says 14 through 31. We will kind of address.
address that, but we'll look at verses 16 through 31 with a message entitled, Everybody is Going Somewhere. Everybody in this room is going somewhere. When you take your last breath here, you will take your first breath in eternity. What you do now will echo in eternity. What you do now will determine your eternal destiny. There has been a poll on heaven, if you will. A writer at the Los Angeles Times uh, in polling Americans and how scientific this uh, poll is, but I think it's at least we could say generally reflective of what most Americans believe about heaven. 75% of Americans polled believe they will go to heaven when they die. 75% of all Americans, if you could just do man on the street type of stuff, go out here to the mall, uh, you know, have a microphone with you, do you believe you'll go to heaven when you die? 75% of the people that you talk to will believe they go to heaven when they die. 71% of Americans believe in a place called hell. Almost as many Americans believe in a literal place called hell as many as believe in a literal place called heaven. Yet only one half of 1% believe they will go to hell when they die. Out of all of the people polled, only one half of 1% believe they will go to hell when they die. Folks, there are a lot of self-deceived people in this world. Our final authority, Jesus himself said, enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, that leads to peace, that leads to heaven. And there are few who find it. There are few who find it. So everybody's going somewhere. Do you know where your destiny will be? Follow along with me as I read as we look at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus beginning in Luke chapter 16 verse 19. Luke writes, Now there was a certain rich man and he habit habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, gaily living in splendor every day. And a certain poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now it came about that the poor man died and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great chasm fixed in order that those who wish to come over there from here to you may not be able. And that none may be able to cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that they may, that he may warn them lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Well, let's pray. Our Father, as we come to you this morning, we pray that the Spirit of God will open up our hearts and our minds and our understanding as we begin to look at your word. We pray that um, if we came in this morning into this room, not sure of our eternal destiny, that the Spirit of God would convict us so that we could know by 
having a relationship with you as we walk out today knowing that if something were to happen and we leave this earthly plane that our first breath in eternity would be before your throne of grace father we pray and ask these things in christ's name amen so what we're looking at this morning is actually a parable that answers the question Everyone is going somewhere. Do you know where you're going? The context of this parable falls within a meeting between Jesus and the religious leaders, specifically the Pharisees. The Pharisees thought that they were on their way to heaven simply because they were the children of Abraham. They were the religious elite. These were the teachers of the law. These were the theologians. Surely, they would be welcomed in this place called heaven. But Jesus says otherwise, and he does so in order to refute their false sense of assurance in their going to heaven by sharing with them the truth. And he does so by way of two examples. We see that in verses 19 through 21. We see two endings in verse 22 with the death of the rich man and with Lazarus. And then we see two eternities in verses 22 through 31. So if you have your pen this morning, if you would like a way to subdivide this parable, you can just write out beside it two examples, 19 through 21, two endings, verse 22, and then two eternities, verses 22 or 23 through 31. Or... If you prefer the way Steve Lawson likes to break it down, two dudes in 19 through 21, two deaths in verse 22, and two eternities, or two destinies in verses 23 through 31. So pick your poison, but that's how we cut it up. So let's look at these two examples, again in verses 19 through 21. What we find then is this, is this uh, uh, story is a parable. And the reason we th that we know it's a parable is because of the way that it starts out. Look at verse 19. Now there was a certain rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen. It starts out with the way that Luke, as Jesus is walking around teaching in his ministry, when he starts a parable, that's the way that he starts the parable. Now there was a certain man. The minute, the minute that you see that, you know, okay, he's teaching us a parable. What is a parable? A parable is an earthly story meant to convey some type of spiritual truth. That's all a parable is. However, this parable is unique because unlike the other parables that we find in Luke, this is the only parable where we actually find someone mentioned by name. And this person uh, that is mentioned is called Lazarus. Lazarus. Which is an extension of the Old Testament name Eleazar. Which means who God helps. And so when you see the term or name Lazarus, in your mind also imagine this is one who God helps. And again it follows the introductory method of how parables specifically in Luke are brought out. For example, in Luke chapter 10, verse 30, uh, and Jesus answering saying, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, speaking of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Before that again, uh, or after that, but before this parable, Luke 13, and he began telling this parable, a certain man had a fig tree which had been planted by his vineyard. And then in Luke 14, then he said to them, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And then in Luke 15, and then he said, this is Jesus, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, father, give me the portion of the goods that falls to me. And so we know then that this is a parable. This is a parable. It's a story. The story is meant to convey a refutation of Pharisaical doctrine. He's meant to put up a front against these religious leaders. Why? Because of their attitudes. Uh, in Luke chapter 16, if you go back to verse 13, Jesus is saying, no servant can serve two masters. Well, 
He will either hate the one and love the other, or he, else he will be devoted uh, to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And then Luke adds, now the Pharisees were lovers of money. That's the precondition that sets the stage for this particular parable. The Pharisees were lovers of money. And they were listening to all these things and they were scoffing and sneering at Jesus as he was teaching the crowds. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Everything they did was for outside religious piety, according to in order to be seen by men. Everything they did was with, with a view to be seen and praised by men, and they didn't care about what God thought. That's their spiritual condition. They also believed that if a person was extremely wealthy, which the Pharisees were, then that was because they were blessed by God. See, they had their own version of the prosperity gospel back in those days. And so their attitudes toward God and other people is the reason that Jesus is rebuking them. But he's also rebuking them because of their actions. For example, uh, Jesus has already told the story of uh, the uh, Good Samaritan. Uh, but just to review that, consider in the story, out of everything and out of all the characters that he could have used, Jesus specifically uses religious people in order to show them that well, you think you're religious, but you're really not. And this is demonstrated by your actions. And then he tells the story. A certain man was going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers. And they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he what? He went and he ministered to him. No. He passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, he went down to minister to him. No, he too passed by on the other side. The Pharisees would not lift a finger to help those in their community, particularly those who were suffering. Because in their mind, they would be receiving their just desserts from God because they were cursed, because they were suffering. They deserved what they got. That was the mentality, mentality that they had. And so Jesus then begins to tell this story of the rich man and Lazarus. This story involves contrasting irony. Consider this, for example. You have two principal players, two examples. You have the rich man and you have Lazarus. With the rich man, you have a person who's extremely rich, <coughs> extremely wealthy. With Lazarus, you have a person who's extremely poor. He has absolutely nothing. The rich man, Luke says, had a joyous life. Every day was a holiday. Every meal was a feast. There were no carries, no worries, no wants. Not so with Lazarus. He had a miserable living. He had a miserable living. Look at verse 20. And a certain poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores. I mean, it also, it, it, it makes it appear as if, you know, perhaps uh, somehow he is crippled or he can't walk. And that his friends, you know, they're, they're, they're carrying him on a stretcher, if you will. And they walk over to the, to the rich man's gate. And, and, you know, okay, on the count of three, we're going to let him down. One, two, three. Okay, set him down, set him down, set him down. Okay, he's down. The rich man will be out soon. He'll be taken care of. That's not the idea of what happened. The word in the Greek to, to lay down is the word to throw. He was thrown out. It's more like driving by in a cab. Get out. Throw him down onto the sidewalk and then drive off. Leaving him to fend for himself. That's the idea. That's the imagery that we need to have about this, per, uh, this poor man. He was cursed from those 
in society. Those who should have been looking out for his welfare did not. The rich man lived in a house. The poor man, Lazarus, lived on the street. The rich man ate good food. The poor man longed for the crumbs. You'll notice that the term crumbs there is italicized, meaning it's not in the original uh, Greek text. Um, it, it simply means the things, it's a neuter uh, plural noun, so the things that fell from the table. He longed to eat from the things that were just falling from the table. Anything that he could get his hands on, that's what he longed to eat. And he could not because the rich man simply passed him by. The rich man had good health. Lazarus had poor health. Even the dogs were coming to lick his sores. Now, I don't want you to think that, you know, it's a dog like Old Yeller or Ren Tin Tin and so on. In the Jewish mindset or the Hebrew mindset, dogs were filthy, unclean animals. They were nasty to be around. And so apparently this man had developed some type of ulcers and so on so that the dogs were coming and they were licking his wounds, waiting, I'm sure, for the day when he were to pass so that they could devour his body. The rich man refused to help the beggar. Lazarus needed the help from the rich man. The rich man thought to be blessed by God. Because of his position. He was probably a religious man. He viewed all of the great wealth that he had acquired and accumulated. That along with his five brothers and his father. That uh, you know we're doing pretty good financially. God has his hand of blessing on our life. We have our best life now. Lazarus on the other hand was thought to be cursed by God. This is not just a view that the religious leaders had. For example, in John chapter 9, they run across a man who was born blind, and the disciples saw this. Uh, in John chapter 9, beginning verse 1, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and the disciples asked him, Rabbi, which is teacher, who sinned? This man or his parents that he would be born blind. You see the idea that they get? If there's something physically wrong with you, it's because God has his hand against you. Of course, Jesus' answer is it was neither. It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but so that the works of God might be displayed in him through Christ healing him. That's why he was born blind. And then finally what we see is that here in just a moment, they are going to be ushered into eternity. Then the tables of God's justice will turn. The rich man will become poor, and the poor man will become rich. A tale of contrasting irony. We see that there in the two examples of rich man, of the rich man and Lazarus. And then we see an abrupt ending. Look at verse 22. Now it came about the poor man died and was carried away to the by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. Both men physically died. Everyone will physically die. You know, they did a study at, uh, Harvard, Inst at the, uh, Harvard Institute, and they came up with this conclusion, that one out of every one person will die. Everyone dies. There is no escape from death. And in the case of the rich man and Lazarus, both of these men died. Lazarus, on the one hand, died and was carried to paradise or Abraham's bosom. Now, we don't use that term today. and This is the only place that we find it in the New Testament. But it simply means the place of honor. This man who was a nobody in life was now seated at the right hand of Abraham. The reason Jesus uses this in his story is because I don't care where you were, if you were common Joe Jew or if you were the high priest that year, everyone had the understanding that it don't get higher than Abraham. And to be seated at his right hand is an exalted place of the highest honor and the highest order. And what is Lazarus, this beggar, doing there? <laughs> the rich man. He also died, and he was buried. 
I'm sure his friends probably came and they eulogized him, talking about what a great man he was, how he helped out the community. But there's nothing more said of him other than he died. And he goes to a place of great misery. John MacArthur said it this way. Abraham's bosom is a way of saying that when this despicable outcast died, he went immediately to the side of Abraham. And Abraham, in the Jewish thinking, was the most elevated person who had ever lived. Their fate was common. Their fate sets the example. Everyone will die. You will die. Unless the Lord returns. You will face physical death. Do you know where you will spend eternity? I know we don't like to think about death. Very few people like to think about it at great length unless, unless there is something in their experience that reminds them of death. Consider Steve Jobs, if you will, who died a few years ago. I mean, this guy was a rags-to-riches story. But he was in great pain in his latter days because the full weight of the reality of life and death came crashing in upon him. And as he was on his deathbed or near his deathbed, he said, Death is the destination we all share. No one ever escapes it. writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 9 says, Inasmuch as it appointed unto man wants to die, and after this comes the judgment. Ecclesiastes 2, Solomon writes, Neither the wise person nor the fool will be remembered for long, since both will be forgotten in the days to come. Both the wise person and the fool will die. Everyone dies. Ecclesiastes 7, Solomon says, It is better to go to a house of mourning, that is, it's better to go to a funeral home, than to go to a house of feasting. I mean, consider that contrast. What he's saying is it's better for you to go right up the street to the funeral home and hang out there. Your time spent there is to be greater to have a greater sense of value than your time going to spend at a New Year's Eve party. Why does he say that? Because he answers that question. Because that is the end of every person. And the living take it to heart. When you go down to that funeral home and you see that loved one or that friend lying in that coffin, there is a question within your own conscience. So you know that you've asked the question before if you've ever been to a funeral. Ultimately, this is my fate. Do I know where I'm going when that happens? So we see then that Jesus is talking about our eternal destinies using these religious leaders. He's, he's told us by way of these two examples in Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, he then tells us about their endings in verse 22. Now let's look at their eternal destinies in verses 22 through 31. In verse 22 or 23. And in Hades, or hell, he lifted up his eyes. This is the rich man being in torment. And he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom or next to him. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in agony in this flame. In dealing with this section on the eternities, what we see are three requests by this man who is in hell. He has three requests, and this is one of them. Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and come down here and cool my tongue because I am in agony here. Hell is a place of torment. Hell is a place of agony. Imagine all of the disappointments that you've ever had in life. Imagine all of the pain, the physical pain that you've had to endure in life. Imagine waking up and having no sense of hope. Now combine all of those things together. 
and experience those sequentially. And there is no hope, no end. That is the place called hell. And so he requests for a drop of water. It doesn't seem like much, does it? A drop of water. He doesn't ask to be let out. He doesn't complain that it's too hot. Can someone turn the air conditioner on? He doesn't complain that he's alone. He doesn't complain that he's there unjustly. All he wants is water, a drop of water. And he wants it from Lazarus. Now, this tells us one thing. It tells us that even in hell, his attitude toward God hasn't changed. His attitude toward Lazarus hasn't changed. Notice what he says about Lazarus to Father Abraham. Then send Lazarus. Father Abraham, I know you're great. You're the greatest Jew who ever lived. I'm not asking you. Send Lazarus. He still views himself as higher than Lazarus. And yet he is cursed in this place called hell. And Lazarus is glorified in heaven. There is no repentance in hell. There is no remediation in hell. There is no repentance in hell. And hell is a very real place. Even though we say that this is a story, there are certain facets of this story that are real, that are reflective of reality. Hell is a place of torment. Hell is a place of flames and agony and pain. John the Revelator writes in Revelation chapter 20. And the sea that gave up its dead which was in it, and death and hell gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and hell were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The fire is never quenched, and the worm dieth not. But consider Abraham's response. It's just a little water. Sin Lazarus. Because I'm in agony in this flame, sin Lazarus. Consider what Abraham says. The penalty and torments you enduring are just. Look at verse 25. But Abraham said, child, remember that in your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. God's tables have turned. Abraham with Lazarus is in an eternal place of comfort. An eternal place of relief, while the rich man is in an eternal place of destruction and chaos and agony and pain and death. And yet Abraham says, that is your just desert. That is just. He denies that request. Moreover, he says that heaven and hell are inseparably divided. Even if someone had the desire to traverse from there to here or from here to there, it is an impossibility. Again, MacArthur adds in reference to this that hell is not remedial, meaning it's not designed to make you better. It's not designed to bring about repentance. It's not designed to let you know God more fully in the sense of your understanding of God. Hell is all punitive. It is, it is the, the penitentiary. It is an eternal penitentiary. It doesn't fix anybody. It doesn't fix anything. It doesn't change your attitudes. It doesn't change your heart intents based upon uh, what you think about God and what you think about other people. If I could open up the gates of hell right now and say, who in here would like to leave this place and go to a place of heaven? No one, no one would leave. That's how much they hate God. 
even at the expense of their own suffering, even at the expense of their own agony. Hell doesn't purge anybody. It doesn't make anyone better. It has no remedial function. It is pure punishment. This man in hell was the same man before he died, meaning in the way that he thought about God, how he saw himself, and how he saw other people. So he requested a drop of water, and it was denied. Next, we see his second request. He requests for a discernible warning. Look at verse 27. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that they may be warned about this place, lest they also come to this place of torment. Let me tell you something. People in hell are concerned about personal evangelism. He doesn't want to get out. He knows that he's there justly. But he understands something that he may not have understood fully in this life. And that is, once this life is over, once you are in your compartment of where you will spend eternity, that's where you go. There is no leaving. But moreover, he understood that the person has to make the choice while they are alive. In that sense, that's why everyone in here is much greater than the greatest person who ever died because at least you are alive. You have the ability to make the decision that the rich man was crying out that his family would make so that they could avoid this place called hell. His brothers were not able to hear that testimony, but you hear his testimony this morning. Will you spurn the grace of God? And run headlong to join this rich man. He tells him this discernible warning. That Lazarus be sent back. Here we have him looking down upon Lazarus again. That Lazarus needs to go do this. And again he realizes that these eternal decisions are things that must be made while a person is alive. But notice Abraham's response. Notice Abraham's response in verse 29. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. What does that mean? Remember, Jesus is talking to a Jewish audience. And if we were in Old Testament times, which before the cross, that was Old Testament times, people would refer to the scriptures as Moses and the prophets or the law and the prophets. So his answer was in keeping with his audience, the understanding of his audience. What that means for us is this. Miracles, seeing ghosts, seeing signs and wonders. <coughs> this is not the impetus for causing one to believe. Rather, what causes one to believe is that information that is found in the scriptures. Abraham says they have Moses and the prophets. They have the Bible. Let them hear them. The word there is akuo from where we get our, our word uh, acoustics. To listen. Let them listen to the scriptures with a view to acting upon that which they hear. They are to hear and obey the truth of the scriptures. And why is that? Because the Bible, beloved, reveals to us the way to heaven. The scriptures reveal to us the way to this place called heaven. Mark chapter 16, Mark writes, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. The gospel is a word that means good news. It is the best news. Proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved or delivered, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So the scriptures then contain the data that everyone must have in order to be saved. Next, 2 Timothy 3, Paul writing to young Timothy, who's in Ephesus, who's the pastor there at Ephesus, says, You, Timothy, or you, however... Continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, 
knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, that is, you have known the Bible, which are able to give you wisdom, watch this now, that leads to salvation through faith. That you know the Bible that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And finally in John 5, Jesus speaking to the religious leader said this, You search the scriptures because in them you think that you have eternal life. It is these, that is the scriptures, that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And then finally in John 12, he who rejects me and does not receive my sayings, as one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him on the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. His word is eternal life. Therefore, I say these things. I speak just as the Father has told me. Why did the rich man go to hell? Was it because he was rich? No. It's because he didn't listen to the scriptures. It's because he had no regard for God's special revelation. How important is the Bible to you? My professor Steve Lawson, in quoting John Calvin, said, We owe to the scripture the same reverence which we owe to God. Why? Because it is proceeded from him alone and has nothing of man mixed with it. This was the unshakable foundation of Calvin's preaching, the authority of divinely inspired scripture. He firmly believed that when the Bible speaks, it is God who speaks. So that if we reject God's word, we reject God, we will end up in this place of torment. And then finally we see the rich man's final request in verse 30. He requests a definite witness in verse 30. Let's look at that. But he said, no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, if they do not listen to the scriptures, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. The request in response to Abraham's answer is you're not going to believe. While the rich man says no, if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. They will change their thinking and behavior. Just send them back. Show them a sign. That's really what he's saying. If they see a sign, they'll repent. And I think the reason that this is included in the story is because how many times did the religious leader tell Jesus, show us a sign, show us a sign, show us a sign. And he showed them sign after sign after sign after sign, and yet they did not believe. And that's what Abraham says here. If they do not believe the Bible, signs will not convince them. Now let me ask you a question. How do we know Abraham's statement is true? How do we know that that's true? Consider the biblical witness. We see this over in John chapter 11. It's the story of another Lazarus. This Lazarus being Jesus' friend who is the brother of Martha and Mary. And they live in Bethany just right outside of Jerusalem. Lazarus dies, and Jesus raises him from the dead. Notice what happens here. So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb, and now it was a cave, and a stone was lying across it. And Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. And I like the King James Version. He stinketh. 
is what that says. Uh, and so he says, hey, Lord, uh, you've been dead in there four days. Those of you who are first responders, policemen, and doctors, and so on, I mean, you've caught a wind of what that's like. That's not a very pleasant smell. Lord, he's decomposing by now. It's four days. And then Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that I have that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth and uh, abound in hand and foot with wrappings and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him, let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews came to Mary and saw what he had done and they had believed in him because they saw this miracle. However, here we have a guy who had come back from the dead, right? He's been dead four days. In the very next chapter, the religious leaders have the opportunity, if they so choose, to sit down with a guy who'd been dead four days and do an interview. You know how many took him up on that offer? No one. Consider John 12, 9. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there speaking of Jesus. They came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they may also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest planned to put Lazarus death to death also. Why? Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. Our Lazarus, or the rich man in hell, this was his argument. Send Lazarus back from the dead and let him appear to my five brothers, which presupposes that the brothers knew who Lazarus was in life. But if he comes back from the dead, they'll believe. This right here demonstrates that they will not believe. You know what they would try to do? They would try to kill him again if he were to have shown up at their house. Miracles in and of themselves do not generate belief. They are to be used as evidence along with to authenticate a message, if you will, which is exactly why Jesus did what he did in raising Lazarus from the dead. So what can we take away from this? First and foremost, I think what this parable teaches us is that we should not take confidence in external religious standards or codes. That's what the religious people did. That's what the Pharisees were doing. They thought that they were in right standing with God because of their physical lineage to Abraham. That they were physical descendants of Abraham and because they were keeping the law. But by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified, Paul tells us. And yet many times today, we don't find ourselves walking around with, you know, making the phylacteries long and uh, those types of things. But we have our own standards, our own uh, principles, our own code, if you will, that we live by. I mean, you probably heard it as well as I do. If you ever ask someone, why do you think you're going to go to heaven? If, if uh, God were to, uh, if you were to stand before God tonight and he were to say, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? Again. You can tell if someone's believing in Christ for the forgiveness of sins or if they're trusting in something other than that because they will always say, well, I've been a good person. What they mean by that is if you were to take in totality my entire life and measure it out, those things which are relatively good are more than those things which are relatively bad. You see, they compare themselves to a relative standard. And you can't do that with God. God demands perfection. Why? Because he is perfect. You be holy because I am holy. And the wages of sin is death. And we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So don't take confidence in external standards or code of ethics based upon human wisdom. That will not get you to heaven. Secondly, everyone has a final destiny. What you trust in will determine yours. 
What you trust in now and life will determine your eternal destiny. The rich man in hell understood that. He understood that for him it was too late. But he understood that his five brothers, that for them the time was right. We are here. People are alive today solely because of God's common grace. It is an opportunity. It is an opportunity to know God, to connect to God, uh, to serve God, to reflect God's glory in creation. And yet many people are oxygen thieves, walking around, spurning the grace of God in their life, not knowing that every grain of sand that trickles down through that hourglass of their life, every second gets lower and lower and lower, knowing they will have a final appointment, a final destination. And without true repentance and faith, they will end up with the rich man in this place called hell. Everyone has a final destiny. Know where you are going. And finally, living a good life and being a good person does not grant you admittance into heaven. Consider what Jesus himself said. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Why? Because he has not believed that is trusted in the name of the only begotten Son of God. How do I escape this place called hell? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, and you will be saved. It is the one who is believing in Christ, the one who is trusting in Christ, the one who has made Christ Lord of his life. And if you've never done that today, I would like to personally invite you to do that so that you can know as you walk out those doors that if your last breath here were to happen today, your first breath in this place called heaven would be your eternal home. <coughs> the screens in hell are filled with those who cry out because of missed opportunity. Don't let today be your missed opportunity. You will meet God as judge, or you will meet him as your defense attorney. And I would recommend that you get with the Lord today and settle out of court. Okay? Any questions so far? This is just an introduction. Again, it's like what the Apostle Paul does in reference to going through the book of Romans. We, we like to think that, you know, if we go through the book of Romans, it is the, the Roman road, the way to salvation. You have to remember that you can't get to, to the good stuff about salvation without going through and seeing the law. In other words, the gospel is not the good news unless it's set against the backdrop of the law, which brings death. Such is the case with our study. We could not define the great splendors of heaven without knowing about the horrors of this place called hell. And so that's where we kind of went through today as far as our introduction. When we come back next week, we'll begin looking at this place. What is this place called heaven? It's a wonderful place. And I can't wait to get there with you one day. We see the Lord and these fellow believers in Christ together and we'll always be forever together with Him. So when we come back next week, that's what we'll begin to study. Let's pray.